Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Tonight's special event was initiated, organized by my brother-in-law, Moshe Mikhail Yakubov, with the help of Hazak organization. Thank you so much. With your permission, I was asked to say a few introductory words uh, about our speakers. And I, I'm sure both of them, they don't need my introduction, but I just want to share with you how these two people play a big role in my life. Many years ago, when I was a single person looking for my wife, just like many other single young men, maybe sometimes pressured by their parents, friends to be married, I started my journey to find my wife. At that time, I was not knowing what I'm doing, what's the purpose of dating, what I'm supposed to do, and without knowledge, I would come home upset that this is not for me and it took a while until I would get back and go to the next person to meet. Until one day I heard that there is a lecture in Briarwood on dating and marriage and it was a, a lecture given by Rabbi Rieti. I came to this lecture for an hour and a half. Rabbi Rieti gave very, very good instruction and structure on what a person should do when he goes on a journey to find his wife. And after that, there was no more upset feelings. I knew exactly what I need to do. I want to share with you, even though today's topic is about uh, parenting a new generation, but it's very, very related to marriage. And Rabbi Rieti said that the purpose of date, first of all, that the, the date is sent by Hashem for a purpose. And the purpose was to find good in this person. And the reason Hashem makes us to be trained to find good in, in that person that we are dating is that finally when we do find the, the wife, our job is always to find good in our wife. And Rabbi Rieti used two words that in English describe this process. He said, you can say, look for good, or you can say, find good. And he explained that what was the reason, what was the difference between the two ways of expression, how we say to find. And the difference was when you look for something, you may find, but you may not find. He said, your job is to go and find good in the person that you're dating. I want to thank you, Rabbi Rieti, because with your help, I'm married right now. Baruch Hashem. And now, the second part is to happily stay married. And that's where Rabbi Chaimov comes. Thank you, Rabbi Chaimov, too. Uh, you, like I said, both of these rabbis play a big role in my life. And um, today's topic is parenting in new generation. What is the reward for respecting your parents? And what is the reward for parents respecting their children? And I want to ask both of these rabbis, do not spare any information. Just give it to us the way it is says in the Torah, because it's very important. And as I understand, my bro brother Moshe Mikhail wants to dedicate this lecture to uh, 
all of Israel who is looking for their halves to find their halves and be happily married. And I think there is a list of Refua Shalima people. Maybe he can read it himself. And thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for, for each of you for participating in this. Hopefully, I'm sure it's going to be an amazing lecture. Uh, uh, maybe you heard about uh, some kind of not so happy news in our community. Uh, in, in our show, there is a guy belonging with him, Nissan Kikirov. He's a brother-in-law. He He's in critical condition right now in the hospital. They had a fire yesterday and uh, I would like uh, to dedicate this lecture to Rufua Shrima, to the names I'm going to mention right now. Uh, Yoel, Ben Avraham, Daniela, Bat Aksana Asnat, Aksana Asnat, Batrai Rachel, Eleonora, Bat Aksana, Bat Aksana Asnat, Tamara, Bat Aksana Asnat, Yosef, Ben Aksana Asnat. Rufua Shrima Bakaru, Bezrat Hashem. And also a refuah shlema to my uh, to parents of my dear brother-in-law Rachami Makilov. May your parents be a karov uh, refuah shlema. And two people we have living in Shmat, Tosa uh, Palina Biti Bat Yafa, and uh, Lilu Nishmat Shoshana Bat Dina. Thank you very much and enjoy tonight's lecture. For tonight, we would like to introduce. Rabbi Jonathan Reitzi, thank you very much for dedicating your time for us. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Special thank you to Rabbi Heimoff for inviting me to be with you in your beautiful Keila and to Moshe, uh, Robbie and everyone else who's involved in uh, putting this evening together. She only know Nahat Simcha Beracha in all your lives and in all your homes and for all Klal Yisrael, all our soldiers fighting for the existence of Eretz Yisrael and fighting for Hashem, his land and his people. Amen. Kibbut Av Ve'em, OMG. This is a biggie. I, I no longer have the, my parents in my, in my life. And it's a huge loss to me. I was close to both of them, especially my father. But the biggest nehama, the, the greatest comfort I ever had was when I learned the Ika Kibbut Aveim the main mitzvah of Kibbut Aveim is Ahare Mitatam, after they passed away. I was shocked, but the logic is very powerful. A person may have made a lot of mistakes. It's impossible not to. Ein tzadik ba'aretz, she'asa tov lo yehata. Shlomo HaMalach HaCham Mikol Adam, he says there's no human being that walks on this earth that only does good and never makes a mistake. There are five exceptions. Uh, they only died because of the head of Adam Arishon from the Nahash. The Gemara in Shabbat, I think Nun Gimel, Nun Hei, uh, lists those five exceptions. But otherwise, there's no such thing as a human being, being in this world, who doesn't make a mistake. But in the mitzvah of Kibbut Av Ve'eim, it's impossible not to make a mistake. It's called Hamurot Sheba Hamurot. It's the, it's the most strict of all severe mitzvot in the Torah, for the simple reason. They're my parents, and there's, it's impossible for me not to not disappoint them in some way. But the mitzvah of kibbut avim in this world is to feed them, give them drink, smile. It's a, huge, it's a mitzvah de oraita. It's a mitzvah from the Torah to smile to our parents whenever we meet them, when we see them, we speak to them, even if you're on the phone and mommy calls you or daddy calls you, to get up from your chair, you don't have to, but to get up from your chair just when you 
the, the, you're on the phone with them as a training in your own mechus, your own character, your own essence, that this is someone I stand up for, even when they're not here. And to smile with, while you're on the phone is also a mitzvah. But I'm, I want to touch on why everything we do in this world is a mitzvah for them here, but the main mitzvah is after they move on. Because in Olam HaEmet, in Olam Abba, the way we feed them is not from anything in the physical world. They can't benefit from what we physically do in the typical sense, but what we give as tzedakah, what we do as mitzvot, learning, prayer, raising our children in the derech of Hashem, that is all a credit to our parents. That is the food they need in that world. So I can't feed them down here. That's done. I, I was given, in my, my mother's case, 50 years. My father, he passed away when I was 56. And I felt very grateful that Hashem gave me 56 years that I enjoyed my father. 50 years I enjoyed my mother. But I got a tremendous nechama knowing that every single mitzvah we do, every child we bring into this world, and the way we raise our children, it is all a zechud. It's all a merit to our parents. And in that world, there's no end to how much they can grow because of what they left behind in terms of children doing mitzvot. So I'm going to share with you how the Torah begins. You, you already know. Bereshit bara elukim. Et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, Hashem, Elokim, created the heavens and the earth. Elokim, we know, is a very special name. All names of Hashem are special. But Elokim comes from the two letter root El, which means power. When we refer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu as Kel, we mean the power. HaKel HaKadosh means the only power. Kadosh means only, unique, one of a kind. I know the translations say holy, but that's not the real meaning. Chazal tells us it means mufrash, mufdal. It's completely separate. It's totally unique. Am HaKadosh, you are the only nation. I know there are 193 members of United Nations. Um, but there's... I so just mumbling under my breath. Um, but there's... There's only one nation. Asheba'a habanu mikol ha'amin that was selected from all the other countries, all the other nations. So you are the only one. We are also the only nation because He gave us His instructions. Shabbat Kodesh is not a different day of the week. It's the only day in its own category. There's no other day that compares to it. So Kadosh means only. Bereshit bara Elohim. Elohim is the only power. Elohim is actually plural, so it means power words. We don't translate it that way, but that's... You look at Shulchan Aruch, Simon Hay, in Or Chaim. Elohim means Takif. He is the power, the force. Baal Hayochelot. He is the owner of all abilities. Baal HaKochot Kulam. He owns all powers. He controls everything. Nothing has power of its own. Wind has no power. It's power word. Hail has no power. It's power wood by another source. Water has no power. It can turn to blood. It has no power of its own. Earth can turn to lice. Wind can blow from the east to the west with all the arbe, harbe, arbe, many, many locusts. And then it's blown back. So the locusts have no power. The wind has no power. It's being power wood. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I am the only power that created the heavens and the earth. And when he introduces, that's his introduction to the whole of the Torah. After that, it's just perush, because once he's the creator, then he only created not because he needs to, but because he loves to. He loves to give. And whatever mitzvah he gives us, it must be that it's for our total 100% benefit. It's impossible that we could ever lose out from doing a mitzvah. In the Lashon of the Midrash, on that pasuk, Amma HaKadosh Baruch Says the only one, blessed be he. HaKadosh Baruch means the only one. I'm just translating it the way Chazal tell us 
the word really means it. Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says the only one, blessed be, Ein Adam Shomea Lo Umafsid. There's no such thing as a human being listening to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and losing out. That's impossible. It's impossible. It makes no sense. Now we're living in Olam HaSheker, Olam HaDimyon. It's a, this world is false. It's Olam HaDimyon, it's an illusion. Ask any physicist and he'll, he'll agree with you. They finally, they're starting to harp. It's, it's really astonishing because science is so behind. They're catching up very slowly. We just turned in the, the Gregorian calendar 2024. In 1924, 100 years ago, Sir Edwin Hubble invented the Hubble telescope. Today it's a veritable satellite that was able to penetrate the universe way beyond our galaxy. And till 1924, astronomers worldwide believed that the entire universe was the Milky Way. There was nothing beyond it. Now, don't get me wrong, the Milky Way contains about 300 billion stars. So it's, it's quite big. And there are many light years in between. Just going, just, just the thickness of the Milky Way is many light years. But until 1924, they had no idea there was a universe beyond the Milky Way. And now, they admit that there's about a hundred trillion galaxies. It's a huge wow. Because the human eye can't see what it can't see. But technology enables them to see beyond. Oh. Oh, so they're slowly catching up. That there's a much bigger universe. And thanks to the microscope, technology has proven... Uh, don't tell the, the uh, don't tell the public school system because they're still teaching evolution as an actual fact. It's a theory and it's never been proven and it can't be proven because it's, it is so weak. Evil Lucian, <laughs> sorry, just swallowing. Um, if if uh, don't, you don't have to look, but in the Contras, it's a small booklet. The Origin of Species. So Charles Darwin, he can join the United Nations, um, he, he came up with this, it's really an incredibly ridiculous theory. And um, one of the biggest proofs for his theory, his support, is that the microscope would look at a molecule. And under a microscope, 140 years ago, they, they had this amazing technology that was able to magnify the size of a molecule by 300 times. And under that magnification, the molecule was completely random particles moving around with no pattern. And therefore, he established that spontaneous generation comes from the fact that our technology shows that there is no order in the formulation of the molecule. This is not in my notes, but it's just bonus information, because you'll see what this has to do with parenting. Michael Denton, Dr. Michael Denton, sorry, in his book, Evolution, A Theory and Crisis, he writes in the 14th chapter that with today's technology, we can look at a, mic a, a molecule and under the magnitude that we now have available to us with atomic microscopes, we are able to magnify the size of a mo molecule by a thousand billion times. You have, to, you have to understand what we're talking about. He then describes what that actually means. He says, if you had enough paper to cover the entire Manhattan, it would not be sufficient to print what you would see under the microscope of one molecule. What you will see, he says, when you look at the molecule at this magnification, you will see millions of entrances into what looks like a huge city. And there are millions of exits. And all the different nutrition that's transported by the bloodstream to the cell, the amino acids and proteins and fats and 
oxygen, carbon dioxide, and all the different par particles in the bloodstream is going in a very specific entrance, and it has its own pathways where it's brought to what he describes as veritable factories that transfer the goods that are being received inside this molecule into what you and I call energy. And what he describes there is mind-blowing because he points out that the molecule is designed so that if it's destroyed, guess what happens within three hours? He says, if an atom bomb fell on London, how long would it take to rebuild the city of London? Decades, with all the plumbing and electricity and cut the, the, the amount of concrete you've got to transport, remove, remove all the rubble. He explains a single cell, when it's destroyed, recreates itself within three hours. And it's a more complicated manufacture than the entire city of London and Manhattan. The whole evolution falls out the window when you see perfection in design. We are created, Bereshit bara Elohim, the power of all powers. And we start off as a tipa serucha. At the moment of conception, your neshama enters this one drop of seed. And in that moment, the neshama resists, but the malach forces it in. You didn't come here because you wanted to be here. Al korcha ata nutsan. You were designed against your will. Al korcha ata nulad. And you, you were very, very comfortable inside the womb, but you were forced out. Al korcha ata chai. And you're alive against your will. The neshama is not interested in this world. It's not Elam HaEm, it's Elam HaSheker. It's Olam HaDimyon. I'm in this world, not for this world. We're in this world for the next world. Eternity. We're born to die. In the Lashon of, of Chazal, from the moment we're born, the clock begins ticking, we start dying. It's, I'm, not, I'm not being morbid, I'm just, just describing reality. But what's extraordinary about life and death is that you, the real you, is not your body. <laughs> that's not you. That's not the real you. The real you is your mind. Your mind is powered by your neshama. So the real you is your neshama that's powering your mind. And when a person dies, the body returns to where it came from, the earth. But the mind, oh, that's the, powered by the neshama. That exists forever. You, the real you, never dies. And the even better news is that after the body dies, there will be a resurrection. The body and soul will be reunited. What's this got to do with parenting? And the answer is everything. Because we're put into this world. Every human being in this room or watching this has a parent, has parents. Even if someone was adopted, they had parents. There's only two people in world history who never had parents. Adam and Chava. Adam was created F. F, C, from, from creation. He had no parents to blame when he messed up. So he blamed the only person he could blame. Ha Isha! Sorry, Ha Isha! That woman! Ashena Tata Imadi, that you gifted to stand by me. He not Nalish. The first Avera was ingratitude. You can argue it was eating from the tree, but really it was ingratitude. Do you know why? Because the Medrash, the Medrash Agada on that Pasuk tells us that had Adam said one word to Hashem, when Hashem said, ha min ha etz, is it possible that you're embarrassed about your nakedness because you ate from the tree I told you not to eat from? Adam was being invited to say one word. Oh, sorry. Khatati! <laughs> I made a mistake! If Adam said one word, Hashem would have been mochel him, he would have forgiven him. But he blew it by blaming Chava. 
Uh, Hashem turns to Chava and asks Chava, why did you eat from the tree? That snake persuaded me. And so she's busy blaming the snake. So Kaddish Baruch says, if you had said one word, Khatati, I would have forgiven both of you. That's something really worth looking into, not for today. That the Isha has the power to bring Mechila for her and her husband. OMG, that's big. But let's get to our real story. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created man and Isha to bring children into the world. And we're not here to raise our children nearly as much as they are here to raise us. They force us to hold ourselves to a higher level of expectation of how to behave, where to live, which community to belong to, the leadership of the community we choose so that our children will be part of a kehila, where our min hagim, our customs, have a kiyum. So comes along, the Torah and tells me, the purpose of parents is to teach me how to fix Adam's mistake. He was ungrateful. And our tikkun, which can be translated as repair, our tikkun, tikkun, which is also a lashon of hachana, it's preparation. We're put into this world to prepare ourselves, not just to fix my lifetime down here, but to prepare myself for the real world of eternity. And that is decided upon my deeds down here. And the one mitzvah, which is the hardest of all mitzvot, chamurot sheba chamurot, is the gemra and Yerushalmi and Peah, is kibbut avein. It's not easy and it's deliberately so. It's deliberately so because lefum Sarah agra, according to the difficulty, is the compensation. According to the difficulty is the reward. So you can tell by the mitzvah how, according to its difficulty, how precious it is in Hashem's eyes. It's almost as though that I have to turn up on time for work and put in the full hours and not cheat any of that time that I've, I've committed in the contract. And I get... I get a million dollar salary, but I'm unaware that there's a bonus salary of a retirement plan of, of a billion dollars if I keep to my contract. And if I were to know that, how much easier would it be for me to be so well to endure whatever difficulty my boss puts me through? If I know there's a billion dollar pension plan? By the way, rabbis don't always get paid that much, but they're... Their pension plan is out of this world. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> the purpose of parents. You and I, in Hashem's Chochmah, could have been designed to grow from trees. But He wanted that our parents would conceive us because it's through us that they become Basa Echad, they become united through their children and it's through their children that they raise their standards. But more importantly, it's for us to learn gratitude. And I'm going to be straight and honest. You invited me to be so. Never second guess your parents. And here's what I mean by that. HaKadosh Baruch who chose them. You never chose your parents. You didn't even choose your siblings. You didn't choose your immediate family. And in many cases, you didn't really choose much of your extended family. It's all part of a perfect calculation that it's Dafka, specifically this father, this mother, that you, Hashem, gifted me for my tikkun, for me fixing me, and for me preparing myself for eternity. And instead of me getting upset or angry or even bitter, when I look at other people's parents who are so much more supportive, so much more generous, so much, be much better empathy and more understanding and more with it, more with the culture, etc., etc., that's all a camouflage. All I'm doing is delaying taking responsibility for who Hashem wants me to take responsibility for. Instead of blaming my parents or my brothers or my siblings or my mother-in-law, 
<laughs> Sorry, just swallowing again. I have this thing swallowing. It's, it's a funny kind of a swallow. I'm here to fix me. And everyone who's in my life is perfectly calculated to surface in my life when they do to help me change the only person I was created to change. And no matter how much I mess up in not being mechabed my parents as I should, Hashem says you always have a second chance. Because even when they move on to Olam HaEmet, now Kibbut Aim begins in its earnest, in its real, real because now they need me much more than when they were in this world. They need us for our mitzvot, because it's a pure credit to them. The first mitzvah in the Torah, everyone knows. Perek Aleph Pasuk Kavchet. Vayivra Elohim et ha'adam b'tzalmo b'tzelem Elohim bara oto. Hashem created, Hashem, the power, all powers, created Adam, Tselem, which means a reflection, Elohim. Well, Elohim is powerful powers. How are you and I a reflection of Hashem's power? I can't fly. I can't do things that, what do you mean I'm a reflection of Hashem's powerful powers? And the answer is, your body has limitations, but that you were not created for your body. You were created for your mind. What are the limitations on your mind of how much Avat Haberiot you can have in your lifetime. Hamat avat Yisrael. Hamat how much avat Hashem. How much emuna. How much simchat hachayim. How much joy are you limited to in your lifetime? And the answer is unlimited. In the 120 years allotted to us, it's unlimited. And the place where we experience the training for adulthood is our family. The place where we are training ourselves to become parents is while we're siblings. Because the mitzvah that mommy and daddy have to marry off their children is one of the four generic, there's six obligations, four of them are generic to all children. If you are Bechor and you are male, you have Brit Milan and Pityon Aben. But the four generic ones is every parent has a mitzvah to teach their child Torah. So that the child can become his own unit, his own chain, his own link in the chain of the Mesorah to pass on to the next generation the Torah that he learned from his parents. You have an obligation to teach your child a trade and will not so that that child can become financially independent. It's all about independence. You have an obligation to teach the child to be married. Teach the child to be married? It's not just a, a 25 cent phone call to the shot and oh do I have a good shidduch for you. No! All the years being raised in this family is my training in endurance and patience and listening and empathy and asking for forgiveness when I make a mistake and being basimcha because family is family. So that when I get married, I've got that training. I can still change if I make some mistakes. We're always able to change. That's one hihur of Teshuvah changes everything. But the real training is in my home. So mommy and daddy are training us. And one of the greatest things to train us in is gratitude. And gratitude doesn't just mean thank you when things go right. It's really when things don't go right is where real gratitude is tested. A health setback, a financial setback, God forbid, a tragedy. Now, who am I? When Hashem squeezes me, and He does, He squeezes us, good. B'nai Yisrael are called olives. Last week's, uh, two weeks parasha, the Jewish people in Shibud Mitzrayim were compared to the olive, because when you squeeze an olive, what comes out? Olive oil. What decides the quality of the oil? How hard you squeeze? The pressure? Or... The maturity of the olive. Oh, so when God squeezes me in marriage with health issues, finances, extended family, difficult boss, difficult clients, when we're squeezed, what comes out? Whatever's inside. 
So if I'm angry inside, what will come out when you squeeze me? Anger. If I'm struggling with my anger, I'm really trying hard to hold myself in and not get angry. Guess what will come out from me when you squeeze me? It doesn't matter who you are. It could be my wife, it could be my child, it could be my mother-in-law, brother-in-law, father-in-law. It doesn't make, it doesn't make a difference. When are in Olam HaSheker. It's just we're being tested. Olam nisayon. It's not a real world. The physicist will tell you that. 99.99999, you have to go 13 places after the decimal point till you get to the zero. This world is 99.99999999999% empty space. If you want to know how much is physically matter, oh, that's zero point zero zero zero. 14 spaces later, one physical matter. That's what the scientists will tell you. They only have this thanks to technology because till now they actually believed that the way you know something exists is if you can see it. Because if you can't see it, you can't measure it. If you can't measure it, you can't observe it, then you can't prove it exists. Today, it's Olam HaFuch. What you see is much more not real than what you don't see. You and I don't see microbes. You and I don't see the trillions of galaxies outside our immediate universe. You and I don't see all the malachim, the spiritual forces we create from every thought and every kind word and every mitzvah and every peruta of tzedakah. We don't see all that. If we did, we'd lose our bechira. We would lose our free will. It would be just so obvious. Oh, I'm getting a billion dollar pension plan. Oh, of course I'm going to work hard. Of course I'm not going to badmouth my boss. Of course I'm going to be loyal. Of course I'm going to act with integrity. It's no nisayon. So Hashem hides from us. He enables us through technology to realize, hey, I can have Imuna so much more easily because now I realize the purpose of parenting, the purpose of having children is not the parenting and having children. It's the purpose is really for me to make me a better me. Gratitude to my parents is practicing for gratitude throughout my life. I owe you, mommy and daddy, for the fact that I was born. I owe you for the fact that for years, before I could boil an egg, you fed me, you clothed me, you educated me, you paid all my bills. And then I have the chutzpah to say, you hate me? I have the chutzpah to argue with you? Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, don't worry, start again, start again, start again. Because the purpose of having parents is not the parents. The purpose of having parents is for me to learn gratitude and gratitude doesn't mean when things go right. That's obvious. When we're blessed, of course I need to be grateful. The real nisayon is when things don't go well. Will I become bitter with Hashem, angry with God, or do I say I love you anyway? My father, Allah Shalom, when my, my mother passed away already for, for a number of years, my father came to us for Pesach. It was meant to be a three-week trip. He ended up being with us for a year and a half. He had a circulation problem with the blood in his legs, and he ended up in hospital and rehabs for a year and a half. In that period, he had not one but two amputations. Then he was on dialysis when one of the, uh, the dye that was uh, put into his bloodstream caused his kidneys to collapse. And at 91 years old, he's on dialysis for a number of months. And because they Hashem, they kicked back. And he, he had to have three times a week, three o'clock in the morning, woken up and taken to dialysis. It took an hour for them to prepare him because he, he had been amputated his leg in two different places. He only had one leg and wasn't able, obviously, to move easily. My father was 91 years old at that time. This is how many times... The nurses and doctors and visitors and the carers around the clock and myself, this is how many times we heard him complain. It was mind-boggling. The nurses enjoyed him, not, not just when they would Google his name and see that he was in over 250 movies. He directed all the voiceovers of all the old Bond movies. They, 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 he was a celebrity in that sense, but he's 91. He's past 
that, that world. And it was so interesting. I, every time I would visit him, they had the television screen blaring. My father was sitting, reading or learning. My father became from in his last, last 15 years or so. He, was, he wrote two books in those one and a half years. He, was, he was spent his time reading. He would, I never saw him looking up at the screen. Once in a while, he would ask, do you want to watch the news together? But he had no interest. That's the world he came from. He was not, he was not interested in that world. And the nurses and the doctors loved him because he was so gracious and grateful for every small thing they did for him. Moving his, him over, changing him, helping him to the bathroom, etc., he was a gentleman, but I never saw resilience and understood it till I saw how my father was happy being alive, having children around him, grandchildren, grateful to the people in his world. Blew my mind. And this is someone who never went to yeshiva a day in his life. We are all made of the same manufacture settings we all have the ability to think you don't have a choice you can't help think you live over here all the time i remember dr brickman and i think it was my monitors coming into the icu where my father was at one point he was reading a book and and dr brickman said um mr rietti do you know where you are that you're supposed to be sedated with all the painkillers and everything else you don't have a mind to read this is where we operate. You can overcome pain. Ask Dr. Sano. I'm, I'm one of the tens of thousands who he cured my spinal pain, which was unbearable. I never even met him. I just watched a video of him. And I would say about 80% of my pain Within 40 minutes, I would suddenly realized, I, what happened to my pain? I was lying in bed watching this. It was not a very exciting video, but he was explaining that pain is triggered from a deprivation of oxygen to the muscles as a means of bringing my attention to the fact that the real cause of my pain is stress in my life. The pain is my friend. Pain is a wake-up call. In most cases, teshuva or kapara or both. But it's also when it's stress, that's the real origin that's causing this deprivation of oxygen to the muscles that causes this... <gasps> <gasps> yes, dear? Uh, I'm just coming now. I'm so immobile. But once it's out of the bag, it's my stress of worry, anxiety, or fears, or just overwhelm. And once I realized, hey, who is the author of my stress? Who's the author of me being frustrated with my boss? I don't think you can appreciate how I am so upset with this person. I've worked for so many years, shows me no appreciation. I do the work of three employees. I work so hard. And I'm thinking about my boss on my way to work, on my way home. At supper time, I'm talking about my... And I go to bed thinking... It's a nine-to-five job. What am I doing? What am I doing letting him in here? This is, my, this is the most valuable asset of my life. Our parents have the awesome job of being the role models of gratitude when things don't go right. And your parents, in many ways, are that for the simple reason that they didn't let go of their heritage, of their identity, in their community. And they've, that, they've passed that on to you. No matter how many mistakes our parents make, we owe them big time. What's the price for being alive? What's the price for being born Jewish? What's the price for being married, having children? There is so much to be grateful for. Much, much more than what's going wrong in my life. And everything that goes wrong is really an invitation for me to pay attention to all the times life was not going wrong. 
How many times have we driven in the car and there was no accident? But how's the Hashem? Only a few years ago I started realizing I never thanked Hashem once, not once, I never thanked Hashem once that the brakes in my car work. Well, they're working all the time, so I wasn't paying attention, so I started saying thank you. And then it took me another couple of years to harp. Wait a minute, I'm commuting into Manhattan, Brooklyn two, three times a week, and for the last 20 plus years, that, that means probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cars have been in front of me and behind me. How many times did I thank Hashem that the guy's brakes behind me also worked? <laughs> OMG! There is so much to be grateful for! And the one place that we learn that the most is because I've got a father and a mother. It's to teach me gratitude so that I'm ready that when difficulty strikes, I should not be looking in Shulchan Aruch, Reish, Chav, Bet, Sif, Gimel. Hashem, how do you want me to respond to suffering and tragedy? No, I'm supposed to know the Shulchan Aruch in advance, so I know how to behave when something comes up. You don't start studying Shulchan Aruch Friday afternoon in preparation for Shabbat. No, we, we study Shulchan Aruch way before in order so that we know how to keep Shabbat. Also, how do I respond to tragedy? How do I respond to difficulty? How do I respond to a difficult person? Reish Chav Bet, Sif Gimel. Chayav Adam. Doesn't say Hasid. Doesn't say Tzaddik. Chayav Adam. A human being is chayav levarech al hara'a to say a blessing to a Kaddish Baruch Hu on when things go bad. Bida'at shelema with a mind that is 100% complete. I'm not drunk, intoxicated. No, I know what I'm saying. <coughs> oh my gosh, my wife's right. I'll deal with it later. <laughs> Nothing there. Okay. And willingly, he's not forced, he's not being pushed by God. He is willingly saying, Whoa! Everything that goes wrong in our lives is a reminder of when everything is right. And when it goes wrong, kapara. When it goes wrong, I'm going to do teshuvah another level. And what ends up happening is we are preparing for the real world. Olam ha'emet. It's not just olam ha'neshamot, because we're really preparing for the reunion. The reunion, resurrection of Tichat HaMetim, that is the ultimate last chapter. So I'll end here. We're going through a very difficult time. I don't think there's ever been a generation in world history where our children are so confused. It is shocking what, what the atheist liberals have come up with in, in the confusion that we are exposed to. And it used to be, I have to give the, I, I really, I know I shouldn't do this in public, but I really believe that credit is always due where it's due. So the liberals really ought to get some credit because um, until recently, science only knew that there was an atom that has its nucleus and you've got the protons and electrons and um, neutrons, but now thanks to atheist liberals, we've also got morons. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're in the midst of a war and it's um, a war on all fronts. I mean, I, and I, I, yes, I do mean the war in Israel, but I'm, I'm referring to a much, much more severe war. Our bodies are being assaulted. Our human rights have been assaulted. And our freedoms. Womanhood is being assaulted. It's a war against womanhood. It's a war against manhood. It's a war against fatherhood. It's a war against the family. I'm not going into the details, but abortion has been renamed as... Oh, this is, this is family planning. 
Bush is not a murder. And in some states, Maryland, they're actually trying to force that the new definition of abortion is up to 24 months. Do you understand what that means? A two-year-old child who's remo removed from the world is not called murder. That's called abortion. We're living in crazy times, and our children are being exposed to, well, how do I, maybe, maybe I'm just confused, because maybe I'm not a boy, maybe I'm not a girl. And, and this is what our kids, even if you don't have it in your homes, and you don't have any devices, this is what they're exposed to, literally in the air, in the world that they are raised in, and it's close to impossible to insulate them. It's a war against parenthood. It's a war against mankind. It's a war against God who created mankind. Because that's the first mitzvah. To bring children into this world. Because the purpose of bringing children into this world is in order to honor the parents because it's training us in gratitude for when things are good and when things are not so easy. That is our real ticket for Olam HaEmet. So I'll close. Imagine... You're going to Megillat Esther reading this year, it's so a month later with Adar Sheni, but um, suddenly there's screams, hysterical screams. I don't know, in Ezra Nashim, for example. And one lady, she's screaming right at the beginning of Perak Gimel, the, the Baal Kore, he's reading the, the story of Megillat Esther, and, and she's screaming, We're gonna die! We're gonna, they're gonna kill us! They're gonna kill all of us! Hamas gonna kill every father, mother, child! We, we're, we're gonna do something! So, oh, calm down, calm down. And she's like in a faint, hysterical. So well, wait till the end of the story. And it happened already. <laughs> and you can't calm her down. She's like filled with anxiety. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is, Chazal tell us that, that when Mashiach comes, there'll only be two sparring that we study. Sefer Torah and Megillat Esther. All the others will no longer be read in public. You know why? Because Megillat Esther is our story. Hashem's hiding in the story. He's not mentioned once. But the entire story is saturated with his story. History is his story. His hashkacha. His supervision. And the story is Menahapochu. Amalek is going to destroy us. Let's panic. No. Turn to Hashem. And it wasn't the whole Jewish people that turned to Hashem. Because most of the Jews didn't know about the decree. Because it, it was just announced three days ago. So 127 countries didn't get the message yet. Esther's request was only the Jews in Shushan who knew about the decree. That means the few thousand Jews who lived in Shushan turned around. The decree of destruction. That's our power. We don't need all Kalal Yisrael. That would be amazing. You don't need the whole Kalal Yisrael to bring the Geulah. It just needs to be, I'm calling out to you, Hashem, I love you no matter what. Please say Dayenu to Atzarot. Please help us take the lessons that you want us to take of living a life of gratitude, not fear. Gratitude and not panic. A life of faith and not fear. A life of Emunah and not a life of suffolk. God, you already told us the end of the story up front. Mashiach's coming, you're going to build Baish Lishi, and then there'll be Tichat HaMetim. And Tichat HaMetim, I close on the Pasuk in Yishayahu, uh, I think it's Nun Dalad, Pasuk Yud Aleph. But don't hold me to it, because I didn't check before. HaKadosh Baruch compares the whole... 2,000 years of galut, of exile, with its persecutions and expulsions and horrific tortures. He compares it, B-Rega Katan Azavtich. It looks to you like I forsook you inside a second that is a small second. A second lasts, well, a second. Inside, B-Rega Katan, a small. So you're talking about a fraction of a fraction of a second. I let, I, I forsook you. But with abundance of love, rahamim, mercy, I will gather you in and look at the mefarashim there, Rashi Madak, forever. The Gi'ula will be forever. And in comparison to the thousands of years of suffering, it will be Katan.
that we will look back. But the greatest opportunity we have, more than any other mitzvah, because it's called Hamurot Shibba Hamurot. As long as our parents are alive, and even then some, we have the opportunity to become better us. And in that schut, we're better here for our children, because of what we gave to our parents. In the schut of that, we should always look to much simcha in our lives, and the coming of Moshe Amen. 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 Okay, <clears throat> good evening. We just heard how important it is to respect our parents. It's all about gratitude. And Sefer uh, Achinuch writes, that's why, that's why Hashem gave us parents. So, 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 so we, so we will learn how to appreciate and how to have gratitude. But I want to talk about the other side. What we have to do for our kids. And this creates many problems. The Mekubalim are saying that's kavod and self-worth. This is the need of the neshama. The neshama needs, and everybody knows here, that I must feel that I have self-worth. You cannot crush a child especially is self-worth. When we get angry, sometimes we're saying to the child things which should not be said. Should not be said. You're crushing him. The child also has a neshama, not only the parents. So we're saying to him, you're fool, you're lazy, you're liar, you're chutzpah. We're saying all kinds, not nice words. So, 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 so what happened? Actually, we're destroying the child. With this toy, his self worth is starting to believe that they are made, I'm worthless. So, did you see once a person that have very, that he feel that he have very low self esteem? Can you deal with it? Huh? Very difficult. Especially when you're living with a person like that, not recommended at all. No matter what you're going to do, it will never be good. So, because the person becoming weak, frustrated, and giving up, You know, I'm talking to many kids. Imagine kids in eighth grade, in nine grades, sitting in my office, and they, they telling me, we're really thinking about putting end to our life. How should I feel? How should I feel? You know, I feel so bad, and by met I want to bring the parents and give each one of them a smack. Did you wake up already? What are you doing to your child? Because we have to understand, even the Torah has such a value for self-worth. 
You're not allowed by law to underestimate yourself. You have a neshama, and the neshama is from under Kisei Kavod. You're part of Hashem. How come you feel so bad? Who destroyed you? Who did it to you? So, the Gemara is telling us that in the second bed, Amigdash, it was a mess. The Kohanim Agdolim, they used to buy the Kiruna, meaning they went to the Romans. He is a Kohen, but he is not, he is not able to be on the level of the Kohen Agadol. And they knew they're going to die. When, when they will die? On Yom Kippur. You're not going to come out alive in Kodesh HaKodeshim. They paid huge amount of money to the, to the Romans in order for them to be the Kohen. And he knows that he's going to die. By saying to himself, it's not going to happen to me. Just what? To feel, to feel that he is worth something. How many died? More than 300. Every year, another funeral. Another one and another one. And they're not, nobody learning the lesson. Because the situation was so bad. Everybody wanted to feel that he may have met worth something. So you can imagine what a child feels. Okay. Choni Amayagin, yes? Do, do you know the <laughs> story? The Gemara said that Choni was a huge tzaddik here. Once there was no, no, no rain. So they went to him and told him, we have nothing to, to drink. He went outside and he made a circle. That's why they call him Choni Ameagil. He made a circle, it's called Maagal. And he said inside, he said, I'm not moving this, I'm not moving from here until you're gonna send rain. It was a drought. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, wind came, clouds came, and it started to pour too much. So he said, that's too strong. Not like that. Meaning he was holding the volume of the Shamaim, how much they have to say, right? That's how much a tzaddik he was. He was saying to Hashem, my pace, not your pace. Okay, good. That's honey. Huge. Tzaddik. So once he saw a person planting a tree that it takes 70 years to bring fruit. So he, he told him, I see that you're a little bit, uh, you know, you're not that young. You're not going to be able to, to eat from, from that. He said, the same way that my parents did it to me, I have to do it to the next generation. And he says, I find it hard to, to, to believe. I wish I can see it. And in the Shamayim, they decided to make Honey fall asleep. 70 years asleep. The Gemara don't tell us how he survived 
70 years with no food bechlam. I don't know. Don't ask me. But that's what the man said. He walked up after 70 years to a new generation bechlam. And he came to his own house. And he's saying to the kids over there, the son of Honey still alive? They said, no. The son already passed away. We are the, we are the grandchildren of Honey. So at least, you know, he said, okay, I have my grandchildren. He didn't tell them yet who he is. Then he went to Veta Midrash. He went to today's Shiva. And he sees they they arguing if Honey was here, he would tell us exactly what he meant. He said, I'm Honey, I'm Honey. I tell you what I meant. They thought he's a little bit, you know, he ran away from the LIJ. <laughs> what is he talking about? Is that he is supposed to be more than 100 years old already. Mapiton. It's not him. He said, I'm honey. <coughs> the more he said that, the more he was in trouble. So he said, he saw that he has no respect anymore. He prayed to, to Hashem, Hashem, please take me away from me. And Hashem took him. Even such a tzaddik like, like Honi was not able to live without self-worth. He said, nobody appreciates me. They don't recognize me. Why should I stay here, Bechlal? I don't want to be here. And Hashem took him away. Hashem took him away. That's how bad it is. There is a book called Aleshu. The one who wrote this book, his name is Arab Shlomo Volbe. He is master of Chinuch. And listen to what he writes. Many times we complain why our kids don't have excitement for Yiddish kind. They don't want to learn and they don't like the yeshiva and they don't like. Where is he coming from? So listen to what he says. Belito da ad chashivut. If the child don't feel that he is important, if his parents were did very nice job to put him down, en avodat a Torah. The child will not be able to learn Torah. Because to learn Torah, you have to feel important. I'm privileged to sit in the yeshiva. If you don't have it, if the parents used to put them down time after time after time, don't expect this child to be one day, he will never be. Why? Because we, as parents, we have a problem. Let me bring, you know, things that we can happen every day. A child came home and he's saying to his father, today I went to shul. And I prayed, Shachrit Beminyan. Okay? And here he is, Abba, Mr. FBI. Which shoe did you pray? What time was the minyan? Were you able to read Kriyat Shema on time or it was already after time? And the child, what do you think he will say? I was one of the first 10 ones, one of the Rishonim. I came fast to them and I prayed the Kavanah and everything else. 15 minutes passed. Abba came to, coming to the child said, 
I just called the Gabai. And he told me that he didn't see you there. He, he, so, so where did you play? You a liar? What do you think? I'm a flyer? You don't know me yet. I know exactly what's going on with, with you. Even if I'm not there, I'm there. And don't even dare to think that Ima, she's a fire. Ima also knows exactly who you are. So don't try to lie to us. Shame on you. Shame on you. How can you lie like this? And then Abba saying to Ima, Miriam, what are we going to do with him? This child, Ashakran, the, the liar, what are we going to do with him? You better take a gun and shoot this child. Why can't you keep, why can't you keep quiet? What message you gave to you, to, you, to your child now? You think from now on your child will love that fila? What did you try to accomplish? What's the message? No? The message was, you shakran, you liar. That was the message. That will give the child the... The, the urge to go and pray and to be in your dreams, maybe. He will put on himself a label, I have no hope. So every time you're catching your child and you say, I caught you. So you're not a father anymore. You put a sign outside, welcome to Mishpachat FBI. And this you don't do. Let them lie. And you say, Kolakavot, Kolakavot. So if one day he will change. At the moment, Okay, he is a little bit cold. You know that your child is not, because when the child starting to lie, meaning, meaning, emotionally is in trouble. So you coming to pour more oil into the fire. That's how smart you are. And then. You want this child to respect you? That's what we want? So what the child will do? He will talk to himself and says, the Torah is not for me. The mitzvot are not for me. I'm a lost case. So let me go outside. And then he'll find all the, all the friends that we don't want to, right? And they will tell him, Chazaku Baruch. They will put him, they will give him support. What we he don't have at home, he will have outside. Why? Because we're dealing with the Nefashot here. The Nefashot. This is not a joke. Many, many kids today are in trouble because we, as parents, all the frustration that we have because we're tired and who knows what, bingo. Because we have expectation. I want my child to be this or the, 
There is a way to get them. <coughs> Only by respecting them. Encourage them. <coughs> Behind your back, for yourself, you know what the child is doing. But sometimes you have to close your eyes. And on this, we're not good. We don't know how to close our eyes. You have to understand, we all have to understand that the, the kavod, meaning the self-worth, is the need of the neshama, is the food of the neshama. And we're destroying the neshama of a child in our own hands. So before we talking about that the kids, of course, they have to, to, to respect us. Of course. But we have to enable them to respect us. We have to show them how. We close our eyes many times. My Rebbe, years and years ago, taught us, he said, be, be, before you leaving the yeshiva, let me tell you something. He says, your kids always will do a road behind your back. That's a child. Don't get upset. Don't get angry. They have also yet said a lot. Keep respecting them. Keep encouraging them like you don't know anything. Just make sure when they're doing a lot, they're not going to enjoy it. They will always have a guilt feelings. Then you know that you're doing something good. Very smart. I'll tell you a story. Amazing one. A 35 years old, a rabbi in the yeshiva, went to visit his rabbi. That was already quite much older, in the 70s already. He went to visit him. He said to him, no, how are you doing? He said, I came to say thank you to you. Because of you, I'm a very good Rebbe in the Shiva. He said, what did I do? He said, if Rebbe recall, in my class were kids that came from rich homes. My house, my parents were not rich. But many of the kids, they came from wealthy homes. And one day a child came with a watch painted gold. No? Painted gold. He said, I got so jealous. He put it on the desk. And when everybody went and left, I took the watch and I put it in my pocket. He's saying it to his, his rabbi. And he's saying to, to his Rebbe, I know what you did to us. The child came back looking for the, for the watch. He didn't find the watch. And he started to scream and cry, somebody stole my watch. So the Rebbe said, no one should go outside, everybody with a face against the wall. I'm going to search the pockets of the kids. He says, and the watch was in my pocket. I know I'm in trouble because you're going to find it now. And by my head, the heavy search and search until it came to me. <coughs> and you put your hand in my pocket and you find the, this watch. And you continued. Then he says, okay, we found it. By mistake, it went to somebody else. 
And he, he said, I was shaking. Who knows what you're going to do to me? And one day passed. He didn't say anything to me. Two days, a week, two weeks. You didn't call me. You didn't embarrass me. You didn't do anything. So I came to tell you, thank you. So listen to the Rebbe. He said, first of all, I didn't know that you took it. He said, how come? You found it in my pocket. He said, yes, but I didn't know it was your, your pocket because I also closed my eyes when I went from a packet to a packet. I didn't want to know who was it. So the lady was over 70 years old. Now he found out who took it. And because he didn't say a word to the child, the child became a very successful Rebbe in the yeshiva. If you will tell him one thing, who knows what will happen? Who knows? So the message to the parents is, do you know how to close your, 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 your eyes? Huh? My child once came, you know, I have a, a twins. They took our kishkes out. Mamash <laughs> kasha. So, they used to fight with each other day and night. But if you touch one of them, both of them, they're becoming a unit, they'll kill you. Well, I don't know where, where they came from. Anyway, one day, one of them come with a note in a closed envelope. He said to me, my Rebbe said, I have to give it to you. I open it up, and here is the Rebbe writing me a love letter. <laughs> Your child is arrogant. <laughs> he thinks he owns the school. And then, okay, I picked up. So, and, and my child asking me, Whoa, what did you write? What did you write? I say, he writes that you're very good in Gemara. I'm very proud of you. While I know that it's like the, that Bechelan is far away from the, the reality. I went upstairs. So, he, he will not hear what I have to say. I picked up the phone and I'm calling the Rebbe. I said, what is he doing? He says, he is like a, a gangster. Walk all over the, 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 the yeshiva, trying to bully everybody. He said, if you're going to do this, you don't know who I am. My father is Rabbi Chaim, he'll come here and you're going to be out in, in two seconds. <laughs> My son, that's what he does. Okay. I kept quiet. I was asking my, my wife, what shall we do? Oh, this child... Uh, I go on like this. If we quick to, to react and say, one more time I say this, I'm going to give you a smack. And whom do you think you are, my father? Right? That's almost every parent will do it. 
If I get one more letter from the yeshiva, I don't know what I'm going to do to you. We're going to punish you. Not alone. My mind was not to tell them anything. Then I went to the bookstore. I found a book about a child, the, the Jerry the Arrogant. It was a story that the child also was arrogant in the school, nobody wanted to be a friend. I said, you opa, that's very good. That's very good. Not to hurt my child. So Friday night, that was the Divrei Torah. I read this book and I said, kids, I have for you a story. If you're going to repeat what I'm Say, I'm going to give you a gift. The whole kara. Okay. So I started to tell them about Jerry the Arrogant from Texas he was. Not you. It's me. Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> And I'm saying his father used to, to give a lot of money to the school and the child felt that he is the boss and nobody wanted to play with him. So this child of mine said, of course nobody will play with him. So it's going through. Very good. So I said, maybe in the yeshiva of, of yours, there is a child that's uh, doing this. <laughs> no. No. Okay. But he was the only one who repeated the story word by word. After two weeks, I get a, a telephone call from the Rebbe. He says, Abrahimov, I don't know what you did, but the child is a different child. He's nice, he's okay. Oh, Hashem. What did you do? So I told him. He said, what an idea, he says. You close your eyes. Don't jump, don't attack, because then I will gain zero. It will stay the same, and who knows what's next. Now, every Jew know that there is a mitzvah between a person to a person, Ben Adam Lechavero. Don't our children is also in this, uh, in the category? Are we allowed to embarrass them? To embarrass them? Are we allowed to get angry at them? No. No. Many, many things. Okay? So when it comes to the outside, how do we behave outside? Shalom. But when you're coming home, that's it. This is off, and now I can do whatever. Why? Because I'm home. I'm home. No, you cannot do that. It's a sur. It's also mitzvot ben adam. And especially to a child that you try to teach him, me don't. If we want to teach him, how are you going to teach him? Huh? 
what kind of a role mother he will see. You know, one can, it's written, Umi Bsarcha Altit Alam. Do you know what it means? When you have a tzedakah to give or something, your immediate family comes first. Then you, you, you worry about other people. Meaning, you always have to look the, to the closest to you, there when you have to do the most is that loot. All right? So now, if you want to do a kill, I want to work in outreach. Who is the first one to do a kill to? Right? It's an obligation. The Alakha Beshuran Aruch. Okay? So now, someone come to be tested to get smicha. So, after if he finished, then the tester told him, now I have to test you on the fifth portion of the Shukhan Aruch. He said, what fifth portion? There is only four portions of Shukhan Aruch. He said, no, no, there is five. He says, I don't know. He said, I cannot give it to you. Because the fifth one is the most important one. The fifth one. The common sense. You know what to do. So now, many times the children feel that we're not important to them. When you feel not important, how do you feel? Huh? If somebody in my shul, sitting here, Paul, and I'll tell him, Belbin, on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, you know, I have to sit you, if you don't mind, of course, one, a row behind your row. Why, why, why? <laughs> I have to come in with a helmet. He start to throw artillery. How can you move me one? Why? Because he feel already not respected. And I have to be very careful with this. Extremely careful. Okay. So now, what does it mean of Hashem? Maybe you no? Know? Oved Hashem. What does it mean, Eved Hashem? You want to put tefillin? Keep Shabbat? Going to the Mikre? It's Niyot? What is Eved Hashem? Hello? Anybody home? What? What's the difference between a tzaddik and a tzaddik gamu? The Gemara says you cannot compare somebody the learning the same page hundred times the, to the one who learns it other than one time. What's the difference? Well, other time is not an accomplishment. It is. But why the 101 he is much higher than this one? You don't forget. No. Because he wants to do Nachatru Achto Hashem. He wants to extra, extra mileage because he said, I want Hashem to have Nachat for me. 
Our job is to, to give Nacha to Hashem. Like we want from our, from our children, we have to do the same thing. So now, many times people don't feel well and don't say, what, what the Gemara says? If a person said that he has Isurim, meaning he has suffering, start to make Biur Chames. What's going on? He said, I'm fine, I'm okay. If you didn't find, it led the Bitul Torah. What does it mean? I learn every day. What Bitul Torah? Ay, 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 that's what my Rebbe told me years ago. And listen to this, this you have to listen. Sometimes you have to be mevatel the Torah. You close your book. Because your child needs you. Your wife needs you. She needs help. You, you. Dafka you. You know. Sometimes a child comes and says, Abba, can you learn with me? He is now busy, I don't know what. He is on the phone, of course, right? He said, go to mommy, go to mommy. <laughs> oh, oh, he says, I have to go to Shio now. Close your book. You stay home and you learn with your child. If you not know when to be mevatel the Torah, meaning if you don't know when to close your book, you're going to get is suing. Because the same Hashem that tell you to learn, which is extremely important, right? Hashem will tell you, now I'm telling you to close your book. Because your child needs you. I have to go to Arvit. Who told you? There is a child over here. So he said, Arvit is more important than me, meaning I'm not that important. We cannot do this. We cannot do that. Our child <laughs> needs us. By all means, everything has to shut off. I have to go to Askara. I have to go here, I have to go there. You go after you finish with your child. I have to go to a wedding. And the child comes and says, I have a test. Maybe you can, eh? Why? Because we have to go to the wedding. So is the wedding, if the wedding is more important than your child, how can you expect your child to respect you? You don't lay the ground for him to respect you. Something that I learned from the son of Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Ruben, still alive, still alive. His son had bar mitzvah. His father didn't show up for the Shabbat. To the party he came. To Shabbat, when the child had to read, Rav Moshe didn't come. Why? They had a good convention. He had to be there. And they came to Rav Ruben Feinstein and asking him, aren't you insulted that you own Abba? didn't come, he said, no. I'm sure that my father loves me very much. How do you know? He said, I'll tell you. My father, before that fila, used to learn non-stop. And nobody should bother him. But he stopped the limut. He stopped. Because I was a child going to yeshiva. 
he used to take my clothing and put it on the radiator. So when I wake up, the shirt and everything else will be warm. Ramoshe himself, the Gadol of Israel, close his book, take the clothing, and put it on the radiator so when the child will wake up, he will not say, I'm freezing in my shirt. Number two, he says, we used to go on the break on the summer to the mountains. And my father had with me every day Chevruta. But he said it was an hour of fun for the kids. Somebody comes with a horse and they, and, and he can collect all the kids. When the horse came with, with, with the wagon, my father told me, okay, we finish now, go have fun. Go have fun. Because he knew how important for me it was, I was a child, how important for me to have fun. If it was us, I said, ah, what fun? <laughs> Say, thank you, I brought you here. Sit down. And now he sees all his friends come out. He feels like a loser. Yes? And number three, he said, I always had a chair next to my father. He made sure Friday night, Shabbat, guests coming, guests are not coming. He said, you're going to sit right next to me. To give him importance. We have to respect you. What we we doing? If we have a guest, yalla, all the kids eat, chick chak, go there like a, a garbage can, yes? And then comes the a... you cannot do it. We as parents, we have to lay the ground for the kids to respect us. They have to, to, to respect us, yes. But we have to, to respect them as well. Don't forget, because of them, they're calling us Abba and Ima. When you don't have kids, right? So they are the cause that at least I fulfill what I want. I want a child. I want to be called Abba. And here comes this uh, child. Finally, somebody will call you Abba. Somebody will call you Imam. So they also deserve some respect. Don't call them names. As Asu. It's Avon. And you're destroying a child. Unfortunately, I have to say, the generation, now there is many kids that need to go to therapy. What's going on over here? Why kid needs to go to therapy? What's the reason? Because it gets bombarded from the parents and, the, and, and some of them, the Atalit Al Kulana, they smack the child, they give him a tah. Did you ask yourself one, why the child behave like that? Something to think about. 
something uh, met, something to think about, because usually parents will wake up when it's very late. When it's late, okay? I don't want to tell you what's going on in my office. Besides the couples, but with the kids. A, a kids have to hug me, doesn't let go, and he said, please don't send me home. Many, many times I have to sit on my chair by myself alone and cry on my chair. That's how bad it is. What happened? What happened to the parents today? Don't you love your kids? They were in big, after all. They are in trouble. The society is not, not normal today. They don't know even where they, they, they belong to. We have to help them, not to destroy them. So I hope that everybody got the message and will be much more patient. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Not this way. This way, you're not going to accomplish nothing. Only kasha. That's the best thing to do. The child will go out of it. We will not accuse you. We knew what he, what he was doing. Any questions? No questions. Chazaku <laughs> Baruch. Yeah, what's the question? Rob said how his Rebbe told him, like, go to Peter Cave, know how to close your eyes, but make sure you have guilt whenever you do the Avera. How do you, how did he still, like, how do you instill that, that you have the guilt? If you always close your eyes, like, what should you do about it? Let them feel, let the child feel <laughs> the guilt. At the end, he'll, he'll do chuba at the end. <coughs> Give him a chance to do chuba. And chuba has to come from yourself. Not, nobody will be able to force you to do chuba. Right? You should come from yourself. So let the child have a chance also. That's all. Yes? If you constantly closing your eyes because the child is blind to you, right? Aren't you like... Teaching him that it's okay to lie? No. They know it's not okay to lie. You have to ask yourself as a parent why she's lying or why he's lying. So it's alarming. It's alarming. He doesn't feel good about himself. So he lies in order to look good in front of your eyes. But actually inside he feels better about himself. No, no. So you take the child out. He needs attention. He needs somebody to talk to him. Somebody that he will stop. He is calling for attention. So some kids will go. I don't know what. And each one has his own reaction. What happens when the lady is upset? They're all reacting the same. Ah, how come they all coming from the same place? Some will cry, some will scream, and some will not eat, and some eat extra. You know, everybody has his own thing. So why can we understand that the child is? Something bothering him, so he decided to lie. Did you see this? Huh? Huh? Also. Yeah. 
to be a bully also. The, the child comes home with uh, unidentified objects and says, who gives this to you? Say, My mother. <laughs> and you're calling the school behind his back, of course. I said, no. So I go, you steal it? You steal it? That's why I'm paying? Who? 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 The child send you a signal, boop, 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 I'm in trouble. Usually we want to treat the symptoms. The bullying, the lying, and everything else is only the symptom to one problem. The child is in, in emotionally in trouble. And that's our job, to get there and to try to help this child as much as we can. And to leave everything aside. The phones, the birthdays, the askarot, wedding. You have a job to do. Extremely important. Okay? Any questions? Oh, here we go. Yes, Akilo. Uh, Rabbi, how do I deal with uh, the child that always wants to win? Always wants to win? Yeah. Okay. That's a good... Uh, that's good. But, but, but there is a way. You, know? you always say it's only a game. It's only a game. You know, you keep saying because a child... Don't forget one second. Until 12 years old, if, if it's a girl, right? Or if, if it's a boy, the one piece of Yetzer Ara. Did you see once Yetzer Ara want to lose? No. So a child always want, wants to win. As much as you're telling me, no, it's only a game. Why taking it so seriously? I don't like to play with you, but it, it, it. They don't want to lose. So if I were you, I will do this. Let them win. All the time? Ah. All the time? Let them win and then, you know, gaza from there. Okay. You know, in, in life, sometimes you have uh, disappointment. That's only a game, you know. One time, two times, ten times, fifty times. We want instant coffee. I told you. Yeah? Chick chuck. I know people here for 35 years I'm saying to them. Don't talk. <laughs> 35 years. Not 35 times. 35 years, I don't know. Still, it doesn't help me. So what do you want from, 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 from the child? They want to What do you want from them? Leave them alone. The atmosphere in the house should be atmosphere of love. Okay, as much as I know, as much as I know, you put it over here deep, and we're going to find a way how to treat it. Okay? Many times I say, if me now, me, by my age, I'm taking my kids out alone, alone. They already married with kids. One of them even a grandmother. I take her out by herself just to ask her, how are you? I'm still you, you know? Do you need any, 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 any help, you know? And we exchanging my daughter and me like she is still a teenager. And she's a grandmother. The kids need it. So why they will not respect me? Not because of my beard. No. 
although I used to do with them. Every child needs you. Every child needs you. I'm, I'm telling you the, 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 the phones, you have to break them to pieces. Especially when you come home, forget about the phone. The, the, the child is the main thing. The main thing. Take them out, one by one. Give them time. Pam, Abba, Pam, Ima. You know, you, you don't know what it does to your child. You don't know what it does to a child. Okay? Any questions anymore? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everybody.